We called him crazy. The crowds are just crazier and crazier. People thought he was crazy. I was called crazy. Exponentially crazier. The explosions oh, and all these crazy. So you have to be called crazy. That's crazy. Yeah. Crazy mindset. I'm crazy. Anybody who calls you crazy, I feel is a compliment. Drill out the lair, flex and rock. Rock, we got a special podcast today. Indeed. Here we are at 8 Lounge. We got the Mr. Olympia team here, and it's really exciting to be able to talk to you guys today here at uh, Resorts World. Absolutely. Jake Wood, owner of Mr. Olympia. Dan Solomon, uh, the man that I've uh, known for many years. Um, many stories we're going to be talking about. He is the promoter of Mr. Olympia. And to my right, the champ champ. The champ. The Derek In the Lansford. building. Welcome all to the podcast, guys. Straight up the lamp. Flex, you think you. about all the times I've interviewed you over the years. <laughs> After those triumphant conquests at the Olympia, those seven Olympia titles, you and I would be backstage and I'd be interviewing you in those moments of victory. And then here we are. The tables have completely turned. It truly has. I was thinking about this um, when we were talking about doing the podcast and how the, the tables have truly turned where now I'm doing interviews with Mr. Olympias and many other athletes and many other champions in their own right again. But it all started from bodybuilding. And this is the platform that set my next trajectory off. And, and uh, I'm very excited now to, to get everybody in the room because we have a big year this year. We have the 60th Mr. Olympia. So, guys, obviously, on today, the keys to the city. What, first of all, what an achievement to have the keys to Las Vegas. Tell us about that, guys. It's, um, it's quite an honor. I know Jake and I, when, when Jake bought the Olympia, he and I sat down and we, we kind of compared those visions and, and both of us, and Jake drove the bus. I mean, the vision was to take this sport and to bring it to levels that um, few had even had the courage to do in, over the years. And um, we, we had a plan in place and uh, we really wanted to connect this sport with newer audiences. Um, we wanted to bring it around the world in a way that it, it hadn't been um, transported yet and um, we were willing to do whatever it took and if that involved increasing production value spending more money on stage production um, increasing prize money whatever we had to do to attract more people men women and children to this lifestyle we were going to do it so I know Jake I, I, I can only speak for, for myself in this case but I, I'd imagine for you this must be a bit of a culmination of, of sort of the initial vision it is. There's no doubt, Dan. I remember when you and I first launched this plan, we were sitting up there in uh, Hollywood, as a matter of fact, yep. you know, at uh, Yamashiro's restaurant up there. That's right. And uh, we, we laid all this out in 2019. Damn. And it's, uh, we keep rolling. It keeps happening. So, of course, you know, 2020 was a little bit of a hiccup. I, I was going to say, like, 2020 had to have yeah. uh, put a little bit of a damper on everything, right? A big damper. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's it's wild though. Cause I, Flex, I know you knew Joe Weeder. Yeah. And um we can only look back at how hard Joe worked to get the world to receive and accept bodybuilding, right? So here we are in the entertainment capital of the world, Las Vegas, being celebrated, being recognized. And um I'd imagine Joe must be incredibly proud of what's oh. happening this weekend. Absolutely. What an achievement from from the two brothers that have taken this sport to, to what it was. You know, Arnold obviously has helped propel that. And now from from that and, and them generations, now we have guys like this who are incredible champions, not just on stage, but off stage too. And, and that's what I want to say too is now we have so many different categories, but every category has an incredible champion that promotes the sport, not as I said, on stage, but off stage too. But as a testament to your guys' vision and the promotion of, of how this is growing and and again, now we're, we're in resorts world, and uh, this is an incredible place to be hosting the Mr. Olympia, the 60th Mr. Olympia. So how did you guys link up with resorts world to get to this, uh, to this magnitude of, of the Olympia? Well, that would be Dan's story there. So we were connected. Um, we all share friends, right? That's the beautiful thing about Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. Everybody's connected to everybody. And um, I was having a casual conversation with my good friend, um, Mark Anthony. Mark Anthony and I go way back, and... Uh, he, uh, he and I were talking about different venue possibilities, and he had said that I needed to meet his friend, uh, 
Ryan Chastain, who of course is one of the guys who runs Zook and does such a great job. And he's a bodybuilder and a bodybuilding fan. So I sat down and talked to Ryan a little bit about the opportunity to open up some dialogue. And Ryan deserves a lot of credit because Ryan really worked hard, stepped up and brought everybody to the table. And we had some incredibly productive conversations. And um, it's hard to find a home for the Olympia because the Olympia, we ask for a lot. We ask for tens of thousands of room nights in a room block. We ask for... Uh, a stage venue that can house a world-class production and also seat an adequate number of people. We need convention center space. We need um, supporting um, community, um, volunteerism, all kinds of things. There's so many elements of what we need from a community, from a city, mm -hmm. from a host property, and it's hard. And we have conversations with many properties around the world, and they don't always go anywhere because we'll hit one of those markers, and they just can't support it. Resorts World stepped up, and we love it here because Resorts World is different. A lot of times you do a deal with a venue or a hotel and they hand you the keys, they, they put you in a room and they say, okay, put on your show and we'll send you a bill. But Resorts World takes it to another level and I really appreciate that. They really get involved. They try to do everything that they can to bring visibility to what we're doing. They do what they can to provide experiential support, make sure that our visitors are getting more for their visit. And um, they get involved with what we're doing. And as evidenced by the fact that we're sitting right here in Resorts World talking to you guys, um, it's really turned out to be a nice partnership. Absolutely. Yeah, I would say, you know, coming from the Vegas perspective, right? Like, it's a perfect time for you to guys to be coming in and doing this here in Vegas specifically, right? Like, we just had the F1. We just had Super Bowl. You know, Vegas is really geared up, as you said, the you know, the nightlife or the entertainment destination in the United States, right? And it really has become that with, you know, all these giant events. You know, we got baseball coming, right? We got basketball coming. This city never had those things. So bringing Olympia here, the excitement, the entertainment, you know, um, it's all it's all here, right? And I think uh, doing the partnership, obviously, with Resorts World, Ron and, and Ryan and the team, like, they really get it, and they bring a lot of value to Olympia or other partners that they do bring in and they see that value and I think it's an amazing year you know to be doing the 60th and doing it here in Vegas is really exciting so we'll figure out how we can pump it up too <laughs> and I got to give you both credit because one of the reasons why Jake and I were so excited to come here and talk to you guys is you guys are doing such an important thing in terms of spreading the word of of fitness and that transforma transformational power of bodybuilding. And, and, uh, and I know um, I'm anxious to hear from Derek on this because Derek's doing a great job too. I mean, it's so great to have a champion, to have a iconic seven time Olympia champion in your self flex who understand the importance of spreading that message and connecting more people to the sport, to this lifestyle and um, what you're doing with this show, with other projects you have going on, connecting to new communities, whether it's, the UFC community or Hollywood or other businesses. That's what we try to do every day. That's what Jake and I focus on. How can we tap into new audiences and grow this thing? And um, uh, Derek, you're doing an amazing job. And Flex, I got to tell you, it's fun. I, I, I don't get, <laughs> it doesn't get lost to me seeing you guys here because I would imagine Flex, this must be frustrating having to sit next to Derek Lunsford because Derek did the thing that you were planning to do as a former 212 champion to win the title. You can see Dan still got that podcast gene in him. Right? I was going to say. Shut him rust. I think that, listen, I, I have killed that ego long ago, hence why I'm, man, this thing swinging all over the place, uh, hence why I'm a lot lighter. But again, I look at Derek, and I'm so proud of this guy because we've had our battles, and yeah. we've, we've obviously, Derek's, uh, uh, you know, been on the show as well. We've had these conversations, but we... I seen this young, again, genetically blessed athlete with incredible work ethic winning the USA. And then he was being pushed hard to get into the 212 class. And then, of course, the battle, the first battle between myself and you was being promoted. And we had many battles. But of course, you know, when I stepped away, I got to see this guy then take his, his first title. And of course, as you said, go on to, to do something that I would love to have done and, and hope to have done, but didn't. But I got to live through somebody that I truly love and, um, again, look at as somebody, as a, as a great champion. So now, as the champ champ, something I never was able to do, you got that title, my friend. And, and if anybody was to, to get it, it would be you because you do an incredible job. But welcome to the show again, Derek. Thank you so much, man. I tell you what, when I talk to anybody, I tell them that Flex Lewis is the guy that made me train harder than anybody else. <laughs> Well, for a couple of reasons. I mean, you were a great, great champion. Your physique stands alone. But, you know, as an up-and-comer, I was still a fan. 
You know, like you said, I had a quick rise going from USA champion all the way up to the top five in Olympia in just less than two months. So I was still a fan of you guys, especially you. You were one of the guys that actually I saw and would, would watch and was like, man, I want to be doing that. So you inspired me from the beginning, but also when we had our rivalry, I was like, all right, my idols are now my rivals. I want to beat them. And so, eh, unfortunately, you got that 2018 title, but <laughs> unfortunately to me, but I thought it was rightfully so. I thought, I mean, it was great. Like I said, you pushed me so, so hard. I, I really had to level up at that point uh, in my life and in my career because of you. So thank you. Well, my man, <laughs> and, and level up you done after that too, because it's all very well being on the 212 stage and, you know, making the weight for that, which is, I know is difficult for you. True. But then we all got to see the true potential of Derek Lunsford when that cap was off. And again, your first year on the Olympia stage, you, you scared a lot of people. And uh, needless to say, were you coming back and then taking that title the next year? Derek, just tell us about that journey of, from the 212 to the Open and, and that next level you had to tap into. Man, it's really been unreal, especially this past year after winning the Mr. Olympia title. Um, Whew. Let me just first say this. If I could have wrote my own bodybuilding story, my own bodybuilding career, it wouldn't have been half this good. That's why I always praise my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, any Amen. chance that I get. Um, so I know it was him working through me, living through me. Of course, I had to get up and do my cardio, stick to my diet and train. But, you know, he, he allowed me to go through some challenges after you stepped away in 2018. You know, I had a rough couple of years where I just wasn't getting that 212 title. And, you know, people ask me, oh, I'm sure you wish you would have done things different. I, to be honest, no, because I just needed to go through what I went through during that kind of valley, so to speak, in my life to be able to come out of it on the other end. And, uh, and be better, be stronger, and realize that God is in control and it's not me. So praise, all praise and glory and honor to him. But it, I mean, I, I'll tell you what, when I was placing second in the 212 to finally winning the 212 in 2021, you know, you don't think like, oh, one placing is that big of a difference. Oh, no, it is. Mm -hmm. Being the champion is special. There's only been a few in the history of bodybuilding in each division, right, that's been the champion. There's a massive difference going from second place to first place. And then I went from first place in the 212 to second in the Open the following year, which I had no idea I was going to be doing that. I was planning on defending my title halfway through the year. I also got sick for a few months that set me back whenever I decided, okay, I want to go Open. Um, placing second was a challenge. I mean, I, to be quite honest, that was better than what we expected despite all the adversity throughout that year. Um, but once I placed second, I realized, wow, like that Mr. Olympia title, the open division is like, there's a reason why it's the pinnacle. It's at the top. Mm -hmm. There's a big difference. And I, and I almost forgot that, that second to first place. But whenever I finally achieved and, and walked away with that Mr. Olympia title and that Sandow, my gosh, my life has completely changed. How so? Tell us, oh some, tell us how with some of, the, of life has changed since you won the Mr. Olympia. I mean, where do I even get started? Side note, I'm now a father, which is amazing. Congratulations. Thank you. That's the best thing of, of this year. Um, so she's coming up on six months now. Uh, and it's, it's great to watch her and, and be a father, just, just watching her and, and my wife become a mother too. So outside of that, you know, I've, had, I've done some pretty incredible things this year. You know, not to get political, but, you know, I had dinner at mar lago which I thought was pretty cool. I um, uh, got invited um, to go have dinner there, you know, when I go to these expos such as like FIBO or I went to Korea this year to the expo over there, like the crowds are just crazier and mm -hmm. crazier. So the impact that you're having on the, the bodybuilding community itself is just exponentially crazier, you know, and being a part of this, you know, uh, the 60th anniversary, the key to the city, you know, being able to speak with the mayor of Las Vegas and Dan Solomon and Jake Wood yourself, like, my gosh, I wouldn't be able to do that if I didn't win the Mr. Olympia title. So there's a lot of really special, and that's just a few things. There's a lot of really special things that come with being the Mr. Olympia, but I will say there's a lot of challenges that come with it too. It's not easy to be Mr. Olympia and to carry the torch strong, but I'm telling you what, I'm, I'm doing whatever I can to, to maximize every opportunity 
not just for my for myself, but as a fan of bodybuilding and, and having the passion and love for it, I want to see it all grow. I want to see everybody winning. We certainly talk you talk about pressure, and there's certainly a pressure when you come with, with the territory of being a champion, right? Mm-hmm. But then add in the fact that you're a new dad as well. Tell us how that has changed your life and, and the motivation going into the Olympia as a new dad. Well, I think you know pretty well too, right? <laughs> For me, you know, I didn't know what it would be like. I knew I would love my child no matter what. Um, praise God that she's healthy, super healthy. And, um, you know, some people could think mm, it could be distracting. But, but without even trying, there's just this extra gear that you have that you want to be able to do more. And you just, you don't make excuses. You go over and above and you just, you want, you expect more from yourself. So, and it's not just about providing, but you just, you just know you can do more. You want more for your child. You want more for your family and just everyone, Mm. as I just mentioned, not just my family or myself, but, but you just realize that like, you just want to be able to do more and you can do more. So it's that extra gear that you have. Derek, I'm going to want to ask you a question. (laughs) All right. When you're in the middle of your prep, Mm -hmm. you're feeling horrible. Mm -hmm. It's 2 a.m. And the diapers need changing. <laughs> Who's doing that? Put the pillow over your head and pretend like you didn't hear it. <laughs> I remember them days, Jack. <laughs> yeah. Well, I haven't been there yet. I don't know. We're about to find out. Yeah. You know. So my wife is an amazing mother. So she uh, she's typically the one that gets up in the middle of the night. Uh, well, I say typically she is the one that gets up in the middle of the night and takes care of our our daughter. And so she's super supportive of me. Great mother. Yeah. So I can imagine that she'll be doing the same thing during prep. Yeah. Dan, obviously you've got one great champion. You know, we've got a lot of athletes that are chasing this man to my right. Um, we've got Hardy Chop and the, the, you know, the, the champion that Derek beat. Um, we've got Samson. We've got Andrew Jacked. We got Hunter Labrada. We got so many names in the heart and all these guys all believe that they can win the Mr. Olympia this year. And that's what makes this year so much special because everybody has that chance. No offense, Derek, as you know, this is a competition, but everybody believes in their heart of hearts. Um, But this year is going to be an incredible battle up there, not just in the open, but multiple different classes. Yeah, so the Olympia is 11 divisions, right? And um, it's uh, the division that Derek competes in, of course, is the holy grail of our sport. It's the title that everyone wants. And every person that you just named should feel like they have a chance because they do. Um, The Hadi Chupan story to me is is really compelling. Um, I'm a huge fan of Hadi Chupan. I think he is a tremendous bodybuilder. And and I love the debates between Hadi and Derek, and that's what makes this sport amazing. Mm -hmm. And and what I appreciate about Derek, and and I'll I'll tell you this right now, I, I appreciate the fact that you embrace the idea that bodybuilding is an art form and everybody looks at art differently. There's been champions in the past that take personal offense when they hear somebody else praise a rival. And I've always thought the absurdity of that. That's what makes this sport amazing. And there were poses where Hadi beat you. And there were poses. Oh, wait up. No, no, to be fair. <laughs> but you'd be the first. No, there were poses where Hottie beat you. And then there were poses where you beat Hottie. And it was a tremendous battle back and forth. I would not have wanted to be a judge at that table. Absolutely. In the end, the judges did their job. You were the champion. And it was a clear, um, it was a clear and moderately debatable outcome, right? It's an app, it's it's not a pure apples and oranges. We've mm-hmm. seen apples and oranges in the past. This is not your classic apples and oranges, but it's two gentlemen with very different strengths. And a lot of people say Olympias are one from the back. Well if that's the case, you're Olympia for a long you're Mr. <laughs> Olympia for a long time because I don't know that I've seen a back in this sport not named Ronnie Coleman that's as impressive as yours. I mean it is Thank that you. good when you turn around. It is pretty much unbeatable when you turn around. Thank you. That when Hadi turns around, he brings some things to those front shots that you don't bring. And that's what makes the sport amazing. And I love the fact that you appreciate that, you embrace that idea, and you know that you just have to continue to get better and better so that way we won't even have these conversations or it won't be up for debate. But the fans in Iran are amazing. They are passionate. They care deeply about the sport. They're some of our most intense followers. And um, 
and I love it. And I cannot wait to see you and Heidi Chopin um, get get after it again. It's gonna. You're be exactly amazing. right, though. You have to embrace it. Like when I look at my competitors now, back when Flex and I were, were competing, I, I didn't have that mindset. I can say I came from a wrestling background where it was just I want to beat this guy. And of course, we all want to win, right? But it's really you versus you. Sure. So so where does the competition uh, lie in, in that conversation? Right. Mm -hmm. Really, it's just holding yourself accountable. Those, those competitors are doing whatever they can each and every day to make themselves better. And that holds you accountable for you to get better. And so that's why I said thank you to Flex Lewis for making me level up. That's what now Hottie, Nick, Samson, and all the rest of these other guys are doing. Yeah, that's an interesting point, and you said it earlier, you know, when your idols become your rivals, right? And Flex was kind of that for you. You know, who are the guys you could feel that from now? Because now you're in the spot, right? So now you got all these guys who looked up to you and are gunning for you, but now they're actually going to be competing against you, right? So, like, do you feel that from these guys, or is that something you feel from them? You feel that competition, like they're, they're, they're coming at you? I definitely understand that. I have to continue to improve and I, I, I want to improve just as someone who's passionate about bodybuilding and want to be my best, that alone motivates me. Um, but like I said, the competition um, simply holds me accountable because I know these guys are working. Right. I know that they are. Um, but realistically, for me, this is a good mindset to have. Once I won the Mr. Olympia, the open division, I realized that I just became the first two division Olympia champion, the first champ champ. So realistically, that pressure that I was putting on myself for that, to, for, to achieve that, really that weight was lifted off. And now I just get to have fun, keep going, and, and thinking and wondering, is that ever gonna happen, is gone. So someone may hear that and say, oh boy, like has he, d d does he now feel like he's the champ? He can, he can lay off the, the gas pedal? Absolutely not. Yeah, everybody's gunning for you now. No way. Right? It's almost like even in some sports, like like fighting sports, right? Like when you do become the champ, you actually become better, right? Yes. Because it's like you have this aura around you now and you have something there. So, like, did you feel like that? Like once you be, you became champ, like, you know, like I'm good now and I'll be able to, to carry this forward. Right? Well, uh, to be honest with you, when I first won, meaning the night that I won, <laughs> you can see it on my YouTube channel because uh, my guy Trevor here filmed it all. As I'm coming backstage off of the stage, I think I was in shock. Mm. I, honestly, I, I think I kept saying, what just happened? What just happened? And I, I just was like total shock. Um, so really, it, I think it took me a couple months for it to like set in. Like I'm, I'm Mr. Olympia. Right. You know, I always knew I was knocking on the door. I was one of the top guys in the world. But I'm now the guy carrying the torch. Yeah. And so I think it took me a couple months to actually like let that set in. But now that it has, you know, it, it actually has strengthened me and given me more confidence to want to go out there and, and, and do it again. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then you're going into, you know, you're going into the, to the next years. Does that put pressure on you because of that as well? No, I think the pressure, pressure is just what you put on yourself. I mean, people can try to put pressure on you, but really it's only if you allow it in. Right. And the pressure that I put on myself is just for me to be my best. I always have. I've always been my worst critic. I've always, even the best day in the gym, I come home, I tell my, she asked, my wife asked, how'd the workout go? I said, ah, it was good, but I could have been a little bit better. Yeah. Even my best day. So, and I think that's just, um, I think, I think every champion feels that way. But I can sure tell you that's how I am. So um, the only pressure I have is just to beat the the version of, of myself last year and 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 seek my fullest potential. You versus you. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. Well, one legacy. I want to talk turn this over to Dan. As a promoter, what is your legacy that and the impact you want to make on the Mr. Olympia? I just want to make the sport more accessible. I want people to understand where the pathway is to participate in this lifestyle. I want to show that there are healthy ways to participate in this lifestyle and that there are people out there that are trying to overcome all sorts of things, um, health issues. Um, there are young people out there that are getting bullied. There are um, people out there that are trying to overcome obesity. There's so many stories that live in this space. We focus here on the best bodies in the world, guys like Derek, guys who are practically cartoon characters out there in the world, real life superheroes, right? But the real superheroes to me are the people that you talk to in the gym or that guy who's in there just getting started mm -hmm. and he just finally got the courage to get that gym membership and his family's rooting for him. I love that. And how that connects to bodybuilding is that what you're doing, Derek, inspires that guy. He might never look like you. He might never achieve what you've achieved in that space. 
But it's that, it's those stories, it's that, it's what you and Chris Bumstead and Jen Dory and all of you guys are doing that are inspiring that person and you're providing inspiration, you're providing motivation, you're providing education and you're lifting people up. And to me, that's what we're trying to achieve. Now, as we're doing that, we also want to do whatever we can to create an elevated production experience. Mm -hmm. We want people who are spending good money, who are getting on airplanes, traveling from all around the world. We want them to experience this with sensory overload. We want them to feel things. We want them to have a visceral, powerful experience so that when they leave, they come back year in and year out. And we're so proud that that's what happens. Um, I love meeting people who come to the Olympia for the first time and check that bucket list item in their life. Um, I love seeing the way they respond. They're emotional response. I love seeing the athlete who's competing at the Olympia for the first time and what that does for him or her. It's all so powerful. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of times we always talk about in order to be great at something, you have to find your juice, right? Your juice cannot be um, getting rich. That can't be your juice. That's not good enough. Your juice cannot be living in the big house. That's not juice. Juice is when you connect with something more meaningful and it's what drives you and fuels you. And for me, my juice is the life-changing impact that what we do has on so many people. And I know, Jake, for you, that's why um, you bought the Olympia, because you wanted to participate in that. And, um, and I know we've, been, we've had a lot of fun doing that together. Yeah, let's talk about that story. Tell us how this came about, Jake, how you purchased the Olympia and, and again, take on what Dan just said. Uh, well, first of all, you know, what Dan just said there, you, he and I overlap a great deal on that because we've talked so much about it over the years. Um, but how did the deal come about? It, well, I can't tell you the truth. <laughs> no, no. Maybe later. Yeah. yeah. One of these days, Jake, we should write a book about the, about the assembly of the Olympia acquisition, the things that went into yeah. it, because Jake, oh, it's yeah. really a story that could be told in a business school, but that's another day for another yeah. show. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a true story really involves uh, some personal items about other people that, uh, you know, or not myself. So, uh, but, um, for me, the dream really began so many years ago, uh, out in the middle of the San Fernando Valley. Uh, I didn't live too terribly far away from the weeder offices. And, uh, I used to ride my bike by there quite a bit. Mm. And I was a 15 year old, 16 year old kid going, man, I want to work there one day. And I tried applying for a job. Uh, it wasn't going to work out for many different reasons. And I never got hired. Yeah, you know, and I thought, yeah, I, I'll be back, you know. So then, and one day the opportunity came around to buy it. And it was like, <laughs> you came back, all right. <laughs> Good. Yeah. yeah. You so, came back. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. That's yeah I, 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 yeah. I had no clue how you took over this, but I'm very glad that you did. Again, if that story comes out in the future, I'd love to hear. Um, but again, I'm very happy, obviously, as many of the champions that you've taken it over and you have teamed up together uh, with Dan to take this to that next level. I have seen this grow tremendously. And a couple of points you mentioned earlier, Dan, you're talking about the experience, you're talking about production. What is this Olympia and how is this Olympia different to any others? So the theater here at, um, at Resorts World um, allows us to do a lot of things um, visually, with sound, with lighting, um, with just overall stage creativity we're able to do some things and it's funny because one of the areas that we struggle with um as producers of the show and uh, our producer is a tamer al gindi he does a great job um, with us and and uh you can't please everybody you can't please you can't please everybody <laughs> you can't and it's very difficult because we really focus on creating something visual that the people who are sitting in the building who have spent a lot of money on tickets feel something and they leave there feeling like they just witnessed some bodybuilding version of a rock concert. Now, granted, we want to respect the sport. We want to make the physiques present mm. with visual clarity and all that. And we understand that. We understand that a guy like Derek and, and you, you guys don't spend all year building a physique to have it not seen with the clarity that you deserve. However, we walk this line because we want to create something visually and experiential for the attendee. Now, the problem is... You have the people in the building. They respond to something. And then you have the folks watching at home on TV or pay-per-view, and it looks different there. That's true. You have the sight lines from the judging table. They expect something different. You have the photographers. And 
those things are not always the same. It is impossible to make everyone happy. Just like when you build a physique, right? You could say, okay, I'm going to go hard on the condition or I'm going to go hard on the size. Mm -hmm. Or I can try to find a middle ground that's going to please the guy who cares of the judge, who cares about aesthetics and cares about so whatever it is. It's the same dilemma that we, we fall in. And each year we try to we try to tweak it. We try to improve it. But we have accepted that when you are in the business of mass consumption, where you produce something that millions consume, mm -hmm. you are never going to make everyone happy. And the 10% of the people who are the least happy are the ones you're going to hear it from. The 90% of the people who loved it, who spend money, who buy tickets every year, who watch it on pay-per-view, who love everything about the Olympia experience, you're not going to hear from them. You're going to hear about the guy who said the lights were overwhelming, the contrast wasn't right, the lines on the physique didn't present. Well, that's who you're going to hear from, and we understand that, and we respect those opinions, mm -hmm. and we do yeah. want to make this enjoyable for everybody, cool. but it is not easy. The fact of the matter is, you know, the Olympia is over in a night, okay? The people that were there, they're only there for one night. How many hours? And uh, videotape, photographs, they live forever. Yeah. yeah so, yeah, so it's a, kind of an interesting relationship there. Yeah. Something that you said earlier that uh, resonated with me and, you know, just the health and wellness industry in general has just blown up. Right. Uh, and we're seeing that obviously these guys, you know, they're the idols and, you know, and, 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 you know, I grew up, you know, looking at muscle and fitness magazine with Jay Cutler and all these guys. Right. And I think that like in our country, even, you know, we have a mental health problem and I, for me being in the gym was my therapy. And I think that's, it's true for a lot of people out there, right? Not just athletes who are trying to compete, but you're inspiring people just to get into the gym, get some mental health, get, you know, get that workout done. You know, um, do you feel that like, are, you know, cause you're, you're really inspiring people to, to better their lives. Right. So I think that's an important thing to touch on. For sure. Actually how I fell into bodybuilding was, uh, I mentioned earlier, I had a, a wrestling background where I went to college to wrestle for a short period of time. And I realized very quickly that, um, wrestling probably wasn't going to pay the bills in the future. I probably wouldn't have a, a, a career in that. So I thought, okay, let's, uh, continue to go to school and get my degree, which I did got a business degree. Um, but I just, I didn't really enjoy anything. I was, I was serving tables. And the only thing I realized at that time that was consistent in my life that I loved and was passionate about uh, was going to the gym. Yeah. And, and, and quite frankly, I didn't even know what bodybuilding was. I'd never even heard of the Mr. Olympia, Jay Cutler, or anybody like that. Um, I just loved being in the gym. Yeah. Right. And so, um, you know, long story short, um, some of the guys in the gym, real jacked guys, like, man, who are these guys? Are they football players? Surely not. There's no football team around here. Okay, they're not fighters. They're too muscular to, to be a, a solid fighter. What do they do? Who are they? They said, well, we're bodybuilders. What do you mean you're bodybuilders? Uh, we compete in bodybuilding. What are you talking about? Oh, NPC, Mr. Olympia, IPB Pro League. Oh, there's like competitive bodybuilding? Hmm. So I thought about it. I was like, man, I'm just, I have not the greatest discipline in my life at this time. And I had no real future in mind other than, like I said, going to school and hoping one day I'd figure it out. So I thought to myself, okay, to give me structure, to give me um, something to focus on in my life, a goal to achieve and go for every day, I'm going to commit to doing a bodybuilding show. And mind you, too, I thought maybe like the UFC, the fighting, the MMA route might have been appealing to me being a, a wrestler at the time. But I thought, eh, before I... <clears throat> commit to getting my face punched in for years and years. <laughs> let, let me, let me try this bodybuilding thing because I'm, I'm in the gym training every day anyway. I'm, you know, I'm cutting weight for wrestling. So I know how to diet hard and suffer and sacrifice. And so it just, you know, competing in my first show, uh, mainly was for me to just, uh, get out of my funk, uh, give me foundation, give me discipline, give me a goal to, to achieve. And, and going off what Dan said earlier about the, NP, the, the first time competitor, the NPC competitor, those are some of my greatest bodybuilding memories ever. Mm -hmm. um, 
You're doing what you love, right? Like you followed something you couldn't figure it out. Now I'm doing exactly what I love and you're going to pay me yeah. for it. And well, <laughs> awesome. at that time, well, at that time I was an amateur. I was competing in NPC and I was weighing 150, 160 pounds. So no way was I going to beat a wow. Flex Lewis or a Phil Heath at the time or nothing. But, you know, I had, to, I had some sort of ignorant confidence is what I like to call it, that <laughs> maybe one day I would get there. Um, if I dedicated myself like I did to wrestling, to bodybuilding, maybe I could get there one day. So I did have some belief that one day it might happen faith yes amen brother and uh but at the time really it's just I, I can remember that uh those were some of the greatest memories that my friends and family would come to the show and we would go out and have a cheat meal maybe cheesecake factory then after the show you know after finals so those are memories that i'll just i'll never ever forget those are some of the greatest memories i've had in bodybuilding i know you are the champ derek what are your goals and aspirations whilst competing and then retiring? Mm -hmm. Have you got anything you want to do when you're done with the sport? Well, I, I took a, a play out of your book, my man. I, uh, I'm building a gym right now over in the Tampa Clearwater area. So I remember when you had the, the Dragon's Lair before the Dragon's Lair, when it was just a private training facility for yourself and some friends. And so at first that was kind of my idea that I just wanted to get something for me. And then I realized that, you know, I want to be competing for years and years. As long as I possibly can, I want to be doing this. You know, I feel like I'm just getting started. I, I, I know I can continue to, continue to improve. So, you know, I, I plan to be here for a while. So in that meantime, uh, I do want to keep it more exclusive uh, to where the gym isn't getting crazy packed with tons of people um, and you're bringing the right atmosphere there. Um, but I realize, too, like there will be a day that this comes to an end. And uh, I really, and what I mean by that is the competitive side of bodybuilding. And I just, I have so much passion and love for bodybuilding that I really see myself in this sport for my entire life. And I want to truly give back to the next wave of guys coming. And I feel that with my experience, I can really help mentor and, and push the next wave of guys. So I hope that people will eventually come to Florida, to Tampa, Clearwater area, and, and I can help push them in the gym and kind of mentor them on how to, to stay focused and stay right in this sport. Because at some point, it's not as physical as it, as it is mental. So being able to, to give back in that way is something I look forward to many years down the road when I'm done competing. The, the, men, the, the mental <laughs> aspect, if I could. Yeah, absolutely. Because, like, you know, we work out together in the, you know, at, at the gym and whatnot, and he pushes me a bit, but he's always telling me, he's like, bro, like, back when I was competing, I wouldn't even be able to sit here with you like this. You'd mm -hmm. think I was a straight-up asshole. Yeah. You know, and he's just like, I was a completely different person. You know, do you kind of have that switch where you're, you're you know, uh, the different person, you know, so when you're in the nice gym, now, right? bro. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could say, no, nah, man, I'm the same easygoing person all year. Yeah. Nah. No. <laughs> oh, look at the trip. No. No. Uh, <laughs> no, nah, there definitely is a uh, switch that flips and it's go time. Yeah. For the Olympia. I mean, we're 15 weeks out. As soon as I get back home uh, from this trip tomorrow, it's go time. There is no beats that are missed. Uh, it's, it's, it's really... Uh, Kind of a crazy mindset like you like you put everything you need to do first you know everything you need to do as far as you know cardio meals training rest therapies all that stuff the posing all of that day in day out months and months i mean everything else takes a back seat yeah you just have to but I mean, does that become harder now that you're a dad right because now you have this other factor in life and so you know Motivation. Like I, yeah, like I said earlier, I feel like it kind of gives me that extra gear to like not complain and oh, you know. Uh, Certainly done it for me. Yeah, it just like kind of gives you that extra kick of like, no, nah, I can do more. Like, and 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 it's it, the love you have for. Do you have? I, I have not. I haven't had a kid, but everybody, everybody who around me, all the yeah. men around me who've, you know, even the guys who like you would never think that they would have. The kid guys are like, this is the best thing that's ever happened. You the need to start greatest. having kids right away. Like all of them just change. You live like through me as well, right? Yeah. yeah, definitely. It's the greatest, man. And like, like I, that's why I said before, like I knew I would love my child, but I didn't realize when she was born how much I would truly love my child. And you can't explain it. It's not something you try for. It just is what it is. Yeah. And so I, like I said earlier, this is my first time prepping with a child, being a father. But I, I think it's just going to give me even more motivation, like Flex said. Yeah, so. It's yeah. wild when you think about it. I mean, he got the title of Mr. Olympia 
and dad yeah. in, a few, in a few weeks. <laughs> yeah. It's awesome. Just back to weeks. back. It's wild. I know. Two championships back yeah. to Unbelievable. back. Unbelievable. Yeah. And congratulations on the gym. I heard whispers, but I wanted you to tell me. So this is now going to be semi-open to the public? Yeah. You know, at, at least um, until towards the end of the year, it's going to be just private for me and everything. Bro, just... Yeah. Is this the place we call private, private only? Because you are <laughs> going to become your camera guys up there. You're going to become Derek Lunsford, and people are going to be like, "I don't know if I'm going to train you anymore." But that's <laughs> yeah. what you need. You need solidarity. You need focus. You need nothing but a church-like atmosphere. Yeah. And every time I walked into that gym, I had control of everything. I bought my training partners in. I had every dial on point for me to win and defend that title. Yeah. And the fact you're doing that right now, I know Chris Bumstead's done the same thing too. Not the public gyms a distraction no. because I've trained in public gyms up until I decided to open mine. But then to get that 1% out, mm -hmm. to, you don't want to look back and go, man, did I not train as hard because I went to the gym and I spoke to people because I was the champ? Or can I keep the champion mentality in when I go out into public and, and become that guy and enjoy it? And then when I need to train... I can turn that switch, as you said. So. Definitely. That's why I'm going to keep it more private while I'm competing. Yeah, good. Like, we'll, we'll have memberships, but it's going to be like being able to control the atmosphere, like invite only. You yeah, know? absolutely. So. Well, I know there's a lot of niceness in the air. Dan, I'm going to stir the pot drop. Uh -oh. <laughs> what has Hardy Chopin got to do to beat Derek Lunsford this year? <laughs> well, my days of answering questions like that are long gone. No, they're not. They're, they're on my podcast. I actually miss the days when I was paid to give those opinions. Oh, well, I'm uh, not paying you enough to uh, be uh, No, but to be honest with you, no. um, it's, it's going to be tough. It's yeah. going to be tough for first, Hadi to take the needs, title. He first needs to get in the country. Yeah. He, oh, damn, yeah. He, he's got to get, get here. But I just... I know what that battle means to the mm -hmm. fans and to see you guys go at it. It's everything you could want in a rivalry. It's, mm. it's respectful. It's built on two differing types of physiques, mm. two of the hardest workers in the sport, two people, two athletes who are at the top of their game. And that's what makes this so compelling. Like you guys are both in your competitive prime at the same time. Yeah. And um, no, this, this battle is going to be amazing. There's something else I want to throw out to you. You asked me earlier about Resorts World and the relationship. I want to talk about all that after that. Yeah, no problem. Keep yeah. Going. Um, one of the things that we get to do here, which is amazing. So the tickets for the Saturday night Olympia finals, they sold out in two and a half days. <laughs> Two and a half days, meaning... Congratulations. And, and a lot of events talk about sellouts, right? The day of the show, they'll say, oh, yeah, we were sold out. Yeah. I mean, we're sold out with months to go. You cannot buy a ticket to Saturday night. What, what are we on timeline right now? How many weeks out? We're 15 weeks. 15. I, you should know this. Yeah, so I, 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 I always so, defer to the athletes. So this was what? I know a few weeks ago that this was announcement done. So basically 20 yeah. weeks out, it was sold out? Right, sold yeah. out. Now, the reason why I mention this, it's actually bad news for some, but there's some really good news happening. So... The hottest club in Vegas, as you know, is Zook. Zook is the spot, and, um, and of course, it's right here at Resorts World. Zook is going to host, we're doing something that's never happened before, the official Olympia watch party on Saturday night. And this isn't just going to be a room with a TV in it. You guys know what goes on in Zook. Oh, Zook yeah. is badass. Mm -hmm. And there's visuals everywhere. There's screens everywhere. And we're going to pump in the live, real-time sound. Incredible. You're not gonna, they're not going to be in Zook watching the pay-per-view and hearing the... They're going to experience the raw footage live as it happens of the call-outs and the action on the stage with full bar service and everything you could want mm. surrounded by the most beautiful people in the world and the best energy and hardcore bodybuilding fans and fitness enthusiasts. And it's going to be the official watch party and it's going to be at Zook and tickets are going to go on sale for that soon. And it is going to be amazing. We were just in there. We just walked the property and did some promo there and we saw the configuration and I'll be honest with you. And I'm not just saying this, the experience at the Zook watch party might actually prove to be better in terms of overall enjoyment <laughs> than being in the building. It's going to be amazing. Well, the acoustics alone are incredible. And obviously, you've got everything else there. Sorry, Jack. Oh, I was just going to say, Zook adds in uh, another 2,500 people to watch the show for us. Wow. And all the bells and whistles, right? Oh, they got oh, the yeah. lasers yeah. and the explosions oh. and all these crazy so things. It'd be awesome. We're hoping we can get you guys there, pop in, oh, yeah. see yeah. the fans. Yeah. And that's what's going to happen throughout the night if you're at the, the, the Zook watch party. Mm -hmm. Um, you're going to see celebrities, you know, like you guys there. You're going to see industry insiders. You're going to see legends there. And then you're going to see a couple thousand of the most hardcore fans in the world who instead of paying, you know, 
thousand dollars plus for a VIP package to watch the show. If you weren't able to get one, go in there. Tickets are going to be pretty inexpensive. Go in there and just be a part of an incredible party and watch history being made at the official watch party. So we're starting to get the word out for that, and I think people are going to really love it. Yeah, man, you got me pumped up. I know. That's, yeah, that's like the I one know. and only downfall to being on stage. <laughs> I know you yes. missed this. I know I'm, I'm, I can enjoy all this stuff. <laughs> right. I know you guys got a hard stop, so I want to ask a quick couple of questions. Um, Obviously, the Olympia this year is going to have so much more bells and whistles. Can you add anything to that I, we've missed out that you would like to fill in with the fans? Any fan experiences and outside of the expo that's going on? Yeah, so the expo this year is going to be upgraded quite a bit. So um, we're adding a lot more square footage to the expo. Oh, wow. Um, we are adding the first time ever the Olympia Combat Zone which is going mm. to be a whole upper level at the Las Vegas Convention Center, which is going to provide a showcase for everything from bare-knuckle fighting and all sorts of mm. mixed martial arts and other combat sports and just a whole myriad of things that will cater to the combat community, the, uh, the martial arts community. There's going to be many disciplines. Uh, Dr. Goldman's getting involved, and he's bringing a lot of his martial arts disciplines mm. with him. Um, so it's going to be a real showcase for all things um, – in the combat sports world. And that's gonna give our, our event a whole different dimension. But you know, you mentioned earlier about bringing all these different industries together. Now, of course, it's known that in the fitness industry, the endemic brands, the categories are supplementation, mm -hmm. um, apparel, and equipment. But the great news for us is Jake and I have worked so hard to go beyond that. And our sponsors, our big sponsors, our companies that are in categories that go beyond that. And that's what we're really working to grow. We have our, our three main sponsors, respectively, are based in um, Brazil, Korea, and now a great new relationship that we're forming in Germany. So that's what cool. we're loving. We're connecting the whole world to this yeah. sport. And, uh, and I think you're going to feel that when you come to the event this year. It's amazing. Jake. And that's been one of our goals from the very beginning, way back in 2019 when we were first talking about it, is how do we spread it throughout the world, make mm -hmm. it for every everybody. You know, it's, ignore borders. You know, we're, we're, we're there for, for the people. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. And uh, that's still what we're trying to do. I'd like to ask both of you a question, whether you split up the answer or not. If I was able to give you a magic wand right now, where would you like to see the Olympia in the next couple of years? Where would we like to see? Well, well Jake, yeah. you know, uh, you know, we talk about this all the time. I have some very bold no. ambitions. I'll let you go first on this one, Jake. Well, I would love for it to still be here, right here at Resorts World. Yeah, that's, I think that they can be a fantastic partner. Uh, sometime we might want to travel with it a little bit. Yeah. And of course, one thing that's kind of a dream is the sphere. Yeah, you know, the MSG sphere. Come on, know. Jack. That's going to be great, man. Come on, the, Jack. The UFC. I might have to make a comeback. Yeah. Might have yeah. to come up, make a comeback for that. So it's sphere. opening the door. It's actually opening the door for that. With yes. the UFC doing their first event there this yes. uh, Mexican Independence Day weekend, that's going to really open that door. I think that'd be awesome. They're yeah. looking for content at the Sphere. Yeah, that that could be very interesting. Yeah, man. but I do know that it is a huge upfront investment just in uh, all of your artwork and videography and everything. To actually make use of it's pricey. What they have there. Yeah. Oh, it's really it's pricey. Really but I think in Vegas, really I know all about this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> but Olympia is big enough that you can have that conversation well, with them because it, it, it's still an, another step above us. I mean, because I mean, we're, we're talking twenty thousand. It's the it seats in there. Yeah, but we're also talking probably ten million dollars. You know, yeah. Just to get you in the door there. You know. Well, you know, you know that's the goal, right? So at least that's there. But. But we want to travel too. There's all kinds of great places mm, around Brazil. Here. We wouldn't do it every single year, but maybe every fourth year, fifth year, for sure, uh, something like that. Take it out somewhere because uh, the emerging markets, you know, are not here where we're sitting. And this is the best market. It's the biggest market today, mm. but it's not the emerging market. So, so I've seen the popularity of the Olympia reach heights that we never even had the courage to dream of. Mm -hmm. I see the way tickets sell. I see the pace at which they sell. I see the consumer's willingness to make big commitments to be at the Olympia. And I see it and I measure it and I watch it very closely. It is my opinion that at some point, it might not be next year, it might not even be in a few years, but at some point, we're going to hold the Olympia in a stadium. I think we can get there. I'm so convinced and confident in our ability to sell tickets and bring large crowds to what we do. When I watch WrestleMania every mm -hmm. year and they hold it in stadiums and I see what they do, I look at that and I feel like, yes, there are practical um, obstacles. 
you want to put a bodybuilding show in an inside venue. You want to protect the, the climate, all that sort of thing. But I am convinced that at some point, just the same way Joe Eater predicted back in the 1940s that the, the world would become, um, would embrace the idea of, of, of strength training and fitness. And people looked at him like he had two heads, like he had crazy. Because back then, athletes looked like Babe Ruth and there were no strength trainers and there were no gyms and there were no supplement companies. People thought he was crazy. Um, but I'm going to take it one step further. I'm crazy enough to think that at some point in time, we'll have this in a stadium and we'll sell 50, 60,000 tickets. Well, look what Dana White done with the UFC. Yep. He's a big Great dreamer. Point. Everybody called him crazy to take on a failing business that had mixed martial arts and have people from all over the world fighting each other. And nobody's laughing right now, right? right. But also, I've personal you... friends with Dana. Sorry. Yeah. He's, he is a the best promoter and obviously in Las Vegas yes. he makes dream, dreams come true and as you guys know are seeing the same thing you have to be called crazy Dan yeah. to be a big dreamer I was called crazy to jump on a plane and come to the United States sleep on a sofa for a year and a half and I was able to succeed and achieve my dreams so I think anybody who calls you crazy, I feel is a compliment. Yeah. And keep on being crazy, Dan. Keep I, on reaching. I see it. I, de I definitely see it in stadiums. And, you know, just speaking of the UFC specifically, right, like they've branched out now. Now they're doing, you know, events, you know, more worldly events because they're in the same mindset of trying to, you know, really expand into global. Right. So they've started doing those type events. So, you know, I think that in the future and doing these, uh, you know, uh, traveling uh, Olympias would, would be really amazing, you know, in these other other sectors of the world, for sure. Well, Rock, I was in uh, Brazil uh, for the Arnold, just yeah. the Hafa, and uh, let me tell you, that fan base mm. is, I have never, ever been to a country that has a fan base that has middle-aged women screaming for <laughs> Flax Lewis. Have you ever been to Welch? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't even get that bit. One incredible market, and I've got it, but there's many more. And, and, and bodybuilding, as you guys said, now is global. And, and thanks to, to, to sponsors who are investing in the Olympia, they, they get into see their logo on that stage, go back to the respective countries and promote, you know, the fitness injuries in itself. But I know you guys have a hard stop, yeah. you know, um, in wrapping this up, where you have an historic event where keys to the city and you guys are going to be doing your, you know, political thing up, kissing babies, shaking hands. But <laughs> I just want to say, guys, from uh, a previous champion, I'm sitting next to the current champion, uh, owner of the Mr. Olympia, promoter extraordinaire, Dan Solomon. I appreciate you guys for this time, this opportunity, and I'm looking forward to seeing, you know, this year's Olympia and us being part of it on uh, whatever level they can give us. Right, Rock? Yes, sir. Can't wait. <laughs> hey, Can't guys, wait to guys, see you guys. Yeah. Keep up the great work. You guys are appreciate killing it, and we're honored to be with you. So well, thanks for having us. Is there any sign-off, guys, you want to do, Derek, to the fans? No, I just appreciate your support, and I would say get your tickets to the Olympia, but they're sold out. So, yeah. congratulations <laughs> on that too, by the way, because yeah, this absolutely. town has a lot of stuff going on. So the fact that that sold out like that is a big, big key indicator. And, and one thing, as a, a person who loves marketing, of sitting next to somebody who lives this life, I truly feel you and Hardy have such a rocky movie going on right now. Well, it's such a <laughs> rocky four. Iran Apollo, Apollo and USA. Rocky four. <laughs> it is an incredible story. You guys are one for one, and this is going down to this year. And again, Derek, this is uh, this is a movie, my friend. Yeah. And, I, I and I'm looking it. forward to it. Dan, sorry. It's a nail biter. Yeah. No, it is. It's Rocky Four. Is it? Is it Drago versus Rocky? <laughs> but, well, I don't know. In fact, I don't even know if it's fair to call Hadi Chupan Drago because Hadi oh. Chupan and you guys, you train in in in, in, in impressive facilities, yeah. and you guys both carry that same blue collar approach. So it's probably not a great comparison. But you're right. This is befitting of a movie, and that's why we're making one about this year's Olympia. And that's a whole other story. It. That's a for whole other story for another <laughs> show. But gents, I appreciate you guys. I know we've run out of time. I could have asked much more questions, but the time that we had. I truly appreciate it. So um, from me and Rock, guys, Strilla, we are out.